Okay, so I'm going to be talking about a lot of things today, but the main one I want to go over is turn order and how it's affected things. So how things worked initially is we were always on boards this big. Uh, this is the first uh, prototype, or half of the board at least, of a party mode battlefield. And we made it out of wood, unfortunately, so it's heavier than it needs to be, but it's not terrible. So how it worked was a player would choose their army and place their territory on the side and arrange all their pieces. And then the next player would have the opportunity to pick whatever army they wanted to counterpick who placed first, and then it would go around the board. Now, it turned out that placement alone was enough to even the first, second uh, win-loss stuff, and that counterpicking was really broken back then, uh, especially on these big boards with multiple players. It just felt terrible, so we ended up getting rid of it. But in the modern competitive sense, things are different. Now we're playing on a much smaller board with a much higher emphasis on balance and not trying to use uh, multiple players um, interacting with each other to cover the weaknesses and strengths an army might have, which is why Crab works really well as an army and strategy in party mode despite only being a single really weak piece. But the way it works today is both players pick their armies double blind after the territory has been revealed, and then both players reveal the armies to each other before placement, and then placement occurs. Now, this distinction with the two paths, because we've, we haven't revisited the old one at all, so we're going to walk through the logic today, actually has direct implications on the final material balance of every army in the game except chess because we decided to set that as a baseline and that's massive by the way and it also may have an effect on how hard we have to work to balance so let's get through it let's first follow how the logic works with the current armies or the current rules so because it's double blind we therefore need every matchup in the game to have a 50-50 win-loss ratio um, and it to work going both first and second. Just straight up, if, if you can't account for the enemy's army during choice, in order for the game to be fair and balanced and not basically be, you know, start out with a game of rock, paper, scissors and then prove your advantage is how that would work. Uh, and that's how things work in fighting games, and that's how things work in most asymmetrical games, like uh, Overwatch, League of Legends, uh, any other iteration of this type of game where the players are able to choose armies, such as Chess Evolved Online, Mad Chess, up to this point, has always had the rock, paper, scissors aspect, where you have to figure out like what armies are better against what, and then try to out-meta your opponent, and then you play, right? That's how Pokemon works, even. So it's valid from a gameplay standpoint, but I don't think it works for chess because it's a perfect information game with no RNG and no direct comeback mechanics that can direct that, that can just even things out naturally. So we would have to artificially even things out. Even in fighting games, you can just go, I have better reaction time than my opponent and that's enough. Uh, and predict your opponent and try to read them. and. The skill matters so much more than the material at play. But, and, and that's even true if two players are close in skill, is the smallest gaps can cause the victory. But in chess, two players that are relatively close in skill, the material imbalance of their gameplay will shift massively and be a direct indication of who should be winning. And the players know that, which is important psychologically, so you must start at an even playing field or someone can feel like they've already lost. And this is true in fighting games as well in really difficult matchups. Like maybe a matchup is hard, but you're like, okay, I have a chance. But there's sometimes like Super Smash Brothers Ultimate, this is like a 3-0, I think it's considered or something, when one character beats the other just hands down. Okay, so that's first part. If we go with double blind, we have to have perfect balance of every army. And what that means is we first 
have to do a single round of balance testing uh, where we get everything to 50-50 with chess. That's round one. And once we have everything 50-50 with chess, we then test where things landed with everything else and address the most extreme ones first, like the ones that are just completely losing, you don't have a chance even at like human play level. And that process is non-trivial. It's highly non-trivial. It's possible to fuck it up. Right, but I can go into engine balancing and how to do it later. For now, we're just going to assume it works and assume that we can do it. All right. So we engine balance every army against chess in step three. So, boom. Double blind. Perfect matchups. Boom. Perfect matchups leads to engine balance all. After we engine balance everything against medieval, we test against everything else and begin to account for it. And that's why we implemented the reinforcement system was to prepare for that goal of being able to take all of these different armies, chess, Shang-Chi, Shogi, and make them able to face each other and then account for that balance to achieve that perfect thing I mentioned. But let's go a little bit I'm going to set the stage here on the other half with board placement psychology and openings in this game. So let's assume both sides are playing chess, the chess army, and they're playing on the 10 by 2 battlefield. Uh, in fact, here, let me, let me bring it up. All right. So here we have Discord user Gluttony Main's lovely, lovely little web app that we have been using for playtesting while we're basically while well, the dev team is in a training arc for however long. So 10 by 2 board, here's the battlefield, chess army, chess army. And notice that no matter where white placed, black gets to pick where their army goes. So you can place orthodox, you can place reversed, and you can place skewed, right? And what that means is you can deliberately go into, uh, black has the very first choice of real opening. White can try to limit things, like placing in the middle means you don't have to go into extreme skewed, but if white places over here, they're offering black the opportunity to go into extreme skewed. Black doesn't get that choice, but that's all you get. And black also gets to pick battlefields, so naturally they'll usually pick the one with the most options, unless they're trying to deliberately avoid something. Oh, that's not what I meant to do at all. Oh. Now we go. So case in point, now we'll look at N2. I wanted to put it down here for some reason. White has fewer options to place, and so does black. So black now can't uh, place on the king side on a skewed opening. They can only place queen side because of the way this, this went, right? And they still place orthodox in this case. So black can counter the opponent's setup a bit. And this, this has massive implications for other scenarios. So let's real quick, I'm going to bring up uh, deliberately the Shang-Chi mirror. So Shang-Chi place here. Black has two real options because their army is symmetrical. They can either place orthodox or skewed. Placing skewed is basically always a win for white unless you think you have a trap in there. So they'll almost never do that, and they always have the option to go here. But notice how I said, black has the option to avoid the losing situation. Now let's go into the other side. Switch cameras. I'm gonna just upload this raw and see how it goes so I can try to get a little bit of editing feedback from my community. What do they want me to cut? What do they not? Um, that way the videos can improve in the future. This one will suffer a little bit though. Okay. Ooh, you can't see that at all. I'll have to... Damn. This isn't actually a good whiteboard like I thought it would be. Okay. So what happens now is white's advantage is only as strong as their advantage against the best counter option for black. Right? That's typical alpha, beta, tree search things. So white picks the 
the best option they can, black picks the best option they can, so white's best option is compared to black's best response each time. And that's exactly the value it has, right? Now, if we allow the players to counter full armies, now, whatever army white picks is only as strong of an option as black's best counter. This means that we would only have to make the army balanced against its worst case, which naturally will tend towards the same place. There might be some mathematical way to show exactly where that is, but that fundamental difference will cause slight material differences in the armies. For example, if white picks shogi, black may, from a meta perspective, pick frost beast because it prevents shogi from being able to play the drop game that a shogi player is good at as much. It completely shifts the paradigm of the game in the same way picking shogi did in the first place. And because of that meta reason, they may pick that just to counter the player, even though the best option against Shogi might be Spartan or something, right? And the, the fact of the matter is, for balance purposes, we only have to make Sh Shogi 50-50 win-loss against their best counter. And the same goes for every army in the game. And we can sit there and do that initial versus chess 50-50 win-loss going first and second balance test, figure out where everything lies, and then decidedly pick where we want to tune everything based on where the extremes are. Based on, hey, what is the best option against this army going first, and then either buff it to counter or nerf it to or nerf the enemy army to deal with whatever it needs to deal with. And we can sit there and look at the spreadsheet of all of the matchups and go, oh, for this going first option, this is here. This going first option, this is here. And that is a completely different game at the end of the day. At least from the perspective of what the rules are, because there will be, you know, Spartan could end up with an extra hoplite reinforcement compared to where they would normally lie. And every army would only have one form versus the this one where we're double blind, we need perfect matchups, we need to engine balance everything, right? Which is an interesting thought experiment because what it means is you will always have the technically stronger army in the matchup going second. At least materially speaking. Like if you swapped roles. Let's say that uh, Spartan actually does have an advantage against Shogi. So when you pick Spartan going first, Shogi absolutely will not be picked going second against Spartan. But if you pick Shogi for going first, Spartan will face Shogi going second. At least if you're playing with the meta that way. If you know you're good in the matchup as a player, you may still choose that. And that's all goes into normal tournament and human play things and skill, basically. <sighs> okay. Now let's go into player psychology of a new player learning each of these versions of the game. In a double blind situation, you are directly encouraged to first try the armies to figure out what you like the game feel of the most and then play it to the best of your ability. You master that army. Whatever army you have, you get direct player identity for it because you're essentially always going to be playing it, right? Because you know that you could pick it going first, going second against everything, but... It also means that you have a little bit extra to learn, sometimes a lot of bit extra to learn, on what differences your army may have in each matchup, which may not feel good, honestly. Okay. Now, the other side of the coin, a new player learning the game in the counterpick case, you can't fully focus on one army and if you do you're just going to have to accept that if you're facing someone going second and they pick something you don't want to face you may have to pocket something and learn something else which encourages you to learn more armies on how to play them 
and directly makes you go, okay, I need to learn all of the matchups, right? So if my opponent is a Spartan player going first, what do I pick? And try to figure that out, right? Not just... It's kind of like in chess where, oh, if my opponent played e4, what e4 counter am I playing? If my opponent played d4, what d4 counter am I playing? So you already have that in chess of, you know, oh, I have to play differently. But it's way more extreme when you're picking a different army based on where what your opponent did and where they placed. And the meta may shift from board to board. A smaller board may favor one army more, and a larger board may favor another army more. Case in point, I believe Holy Empire loves the massive boards because they can take more advantage of their advanced mobility. On the flip side, Spartan and Golden Horde probably hate the big boards because they move pretty short range overall because they have a lot of leapers involved. Okay, that's where that discussion was going in my head. I don't know which is better because... The thing with the double blind version is there is still a sense of fairness to it. And it is how things are typically done in this space. And it is really reasonable to understand. And then there's the big reveal of, oh, what matchup am I facing? You know? Meanwhile, with the counter pick. I feel like the the counterpick balance thing that I was just discussing may be incomplete, especially in that last step where I say, oh, look at all of the matchups and then tune accordingly. That may not be completely valid, and it may trend towards having to do more individual matchup balancing. Because... It may just be impossible for one army, if it cares a lot about tempo, to not have a massive swing going between going first and second. Like something high defense that's really resilient, like uh, the chess layout, unless your opponent has a cannon, uh, or the shogi layout, they're probably pretty resilient at going second. But something like Twin Suns or Shang-Chi going second, they may not be so resilient. Because that tempo is everything. <sighs> and that question of where the other side leads on the counter pick, and how far down the rabbit hole we can go, it may not be a band-aid fix that prevents us from having to do more individual matchup tuning, where engine balance everything is required anyway and then we just have a game with counter picks which doesn't allow for as much individual expression but the pros if it works of counter pick strat is obvious to me because it may mean we have less work and it may also mean that the game encourages more exploration of different armies and more learning. So it acts like Titan's Battalion is the gateway to Shang-Chi and Shogi for Western players, potentially. Which would be cool. I gave up on it being a goal a long time ago, but it would be cool. Anyways, that's where my head's at. Uh, I had one more thing I wanted to discuss. We can make this a double feature. Oh, <laughs> here's something to note. So what we discovered with Great Pyramid going first and Palace going second, because this was briefly discussed. So this situation is kind of a massive version of the balance issue that Couch Tomato was bringing up, where... Certain matchups may just not be able to be balanced. Or you, you may run into issues balancing armies when you swap who's going first and who's going second. 
So the way this works, if Shangxi goes first, is they are immediately worried about king safety. It doesn't look like it, but they are, because the threat is Mayat going here and pinning everything down. But if you either move the guard or one of the kings here turn one, you don't have to worry about king safety as much and you can play as normal. But you still, you know, owe tempo, which is potentially an issue, but owing tempo is like the name of the game with Shang-Chi just because, you know, what cannons do to rooks, naturally. But going first, Mayat, which can move anywhere on the board, can't capture, can't be captured, blocks here, and now this king can't, it's, it's just impossible to move it. Because the guards can't get through it, and the king can't get through it, and the king can't get through its own guards, right? So this guy's just locked here. Then you spend uh, some amount of time moving the pharaoh, summoning the ka somewhere, probably here or here, or here or here, you know, just needs to be within one of this square, summoning the boulder here, and then after, you know, dealing with your opponent's death flails as they try to do things to stop you, right? To either, you know, get you off of this or whatever, you could just intervene with literally anything. Uh, and, you know, eventually like, oh, I guess I have to kill this here, not mentioning that the cannons are loading. You move, you summon the Ka, you summon the boulder. The boulder is able to capture any number of pieces as it moves. It only moves once and it rolls down the pyramid, step, 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 and then one, two, one, two, one, bam. So on the nine wide battlefields, even if, uh, technically you get away with it on the deeper battlefields if we implement Tomatoes thing. I'm on a tangent that, ha that most of the people who aren't longtime viewers who are in the Discord and who have playtested shit won't understand. Sorry about that. But my point is this army that I have here that looks completely random against the Shang-Chi army wins. As long as they're white going first against this matchup in this case. And it's easy to prove as long as you know the technique and the pattern. Because once you do this, as long as you eventually summon the boulder here and eventually move Mayat, it's checkmate. Because they were never able to move these out of the way, and the boulder covers this square, and you're not able to put anything in the way, right? <sighs> there may be winning matchups for other reasons, where just there's a meta big picture strategy where you just have to pick them apart in this way that causes us if we're engine balancing everything to have to address uh that with a difference of material because we can't change the army against its worst matchup without altering how it plays against everything else however if we're balancing this way we only have to worry about every army's worst matchup and we can but it, it, it might end up where we end up in a vicious cycle chain where army A is stronger than army B. So we put army B going first and army A going second and then nerf army A down or buff army or buff army A or nerf army B until the win loss with that turn order is 50-50. And then army C is over here like, oh, I beat you. So you now have to be either buffed or nerfed. But we're not going to mess with this one because it would break this matchup. So we nerf this one down. And then this one always beats this one going second. And yeah, that's that, that was the situation I was worried about earlier. So I think we will always be forced to do individual matchup tuning. Especially when we have such a wide variety of cool armies. We have very deliberately included an army with two kings. An army that the entire point is to be as aggressive as possible. An army who has ghost stones. I don't even have to describe anything else. This has ghost stones. We've included Shang-Chi, who has a big open space, and it's all about like trying to block things from being able to move in that open space, because they, you know, everything in that army is blockable. Rook lines, if you just intervene here, they can't go past you. They can move over here, but then you can potentially just keep blocking them and tactics matter. So, like, uh, something that 
happens in Shang-Chi, just real quick. Boom, boom. You can now move this here to intercede on the development of this horse and the development of this rook. But you can't do it yet because the rook would take. So if we, you know, just give a couple more moves. Oh, that's not supposed to be there. And put this here. Now, same thing. You've blocked the horse. You've blocked the rook. If they back off and like, oh, I'm going to try to get out anyway, you can still keep blocking them. It opens up the horse, sure, but now this rook is still not in the game while this cannon potentially has influence this way, right? And that's how Shang-Chi is played. It's on an open field. But for chess, it's all about pawn structure and ways to deal with it. So the Shang-Chi army is all... It, you do this thing, but for chess... Right? Even if I do something really normal, like, uh, say this. The bishops are able to either intervene through and interact opposing the enemy pawn structure, or the other one is able to try to get behind and target the base, right? And that's the typical play of a chess army. And that's also, like, a, a bishop here would be pretty pretty trapped, all things considered, especially if this pawn structure here was a little more, you know, like this or something, right? There's no way to get this bishop into the game because the pawns cover everything. But you can immediately see, on the other hand, this knight is able to get protected by the pawn inside the part of the enemy pawn structure, affect parts of the enemy formation, and then now there's a potential idea here to get this pawn to not be targeting this somehow. Maybe push all the way up to here. And then with the knight here, you're able to capture this spot. And it's just a matter of getting to the point where you can pick this apart. So it's all about taking apart the enemy structure. That's why the knights leap here. Which is completely different from how Shang-Chi works, which is why the two have been so incompatible when we put them on the same board. Shang-Chi doesn't have the tools to pick apart the enemy structure naturally. And chess is just able to exploit the open position so much better than a Shang-Chi army would be able to, because it's, you know, massively stronger. And those dynamics exist in every matchup in the game. Maybe not to the same extreme, but they do. Uh, for example, Spartans. Spartans, because they have, you know, all of these pieces have jumping movements as opposed to the chess army only having these two, they want the position to stay closed. And their pawns are stronger than the enemy pawns anyway, the Berylinas, by like, you know, uh, a fifth to a third of a single unit of material. So they don't want to trade the pawns. And furthermore, they want to lock down the enemy structure so they can take advantage of their leapers. But they also don't have natural ways to deal with the enemy pawn structure and attack the bases. Because just this right here, if I move this back, if you want to attack this base, you have to go to here if you want to do it with a lieutenant, and here if you want to do it with a captain. But you deal with both of those just by making a natural chess move. So... The fact that these dynamics exist makes me think that we're going to end up in that rock, paper, scissors scenario if we try to solve all of our problems with counterpicking. Despite that, it might still make the game better. But I don't know. I sincerely don't know. Give me your thoughts in the comments down below. Uh... Hopefully this tracked for those of you that have been paying attention, and uh, I hope you all have a good day.